Good evening, good evening, everyone. This is Jim Ostrowski with the Environmental Support Division in the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. And I welcome you to our Pelston PFAS Investigation Town Hall meeting. Uh, glad you all could join us tonight. Uh, just to let you know, this is a little different than I know a lot of you are used to in terms of hosting public meetings. This is new to us too, but we're learning. Um, I just want to go over some basic guidelines in case you've never joined a meeting using the GoToWebinar platform. So just a couple housekeeping guidelines before I turn it over to our moderator, Steve. Uh, first thing is that, as you probably noticed, all lines are muted, and that means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Uh, if you do have a question, though, today, tonight, during the, the meeting, feel free to uh, type it in to the question box on your GoToWebinar toolbar. So over to your right of your screen, you have a toolbar. There should be a drop down for questions. And you can type in a question, hit submit, and we'll see those and we'll go over those uh, towards the end today. Now also, if you'd like, um, at the end, we'll have the option also to raise your hand. So also on your toolbar, you'll see a little button there that has a little hand icon. You click on that and that shows us that you have your hand up and we will call on you and you, if you have a microphone, you just will unmute you so you can talk and ask your question. Uh, it also lets you know that we are recording the meeting and we will share it you know, with attendees if, uh, in a few days. So with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to Steve Sliver. So Steve, you there? I am, can you hear me, Jim? Yep, we got you. Perfect. Well, hey, good evening, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you tonight moderating our town hall for an update on the PFAS investigation in Pelston. I'm, I'm Steve Sliver, Executive Director of Michigan's PFAS Action Response Team. And you can see here from the agenda on the next slide that uh, we uh, want to um, acknowledge again um, a a session we had earlier today for some Pelston teacher and student recognition and uh, talk a little bit about a citizens advisory work group and then get some updates on uh, what's happening in the investigation there in Pelston. So if you can go to the next slide, Jim. Yeah, earlier this afternoon I had the pleasure of uh, uh, moderating a another virtual meeting where we um, recognized the efforts of uh, Pelston High School teachers Steve Corlew and Brooke Groff, as well as students um, Zoe Ball, Jaden Booth, Samantha Christensen, Vivian Dyer, Bren Warner, Elizabeth Slater, Katie Schrock, Madison Hutchinson, and, and uh, Jada Yapez. I mean, they're the ones that really um, found that we had an issue that needed to be addressed. They, they took the initiative and uh, were very appreciative of the efforts that they undertook you know, last year, which has led to public health protective measures today and an ongoing investigation that we're gonna talk about. You can go to the next slide, Jim. And uh, so today's uh, earlier session, we uh, acknowledged and, and uh, congratulated them for their efforts, uh, Governor Whitmer provided each one of them with a tribute, uh, which is a pretty big deal. And as well as the state agencies also gave them some uh, teamwork coins to recognize their, their teamwork and excellence and, and uh, leadership. And so once again, I wanna say congrats to all of them. I think it was an awesome effort. And I know the community there is proud of them as well. So one of the things I wanted to mention that we talked about briefly when we were there back, I think it was February 12th for the initial town hall. And uh, we mentioned that the uh, Michigan's PFAS action response team looks for advice from various stakeholders. And we have one group of advisors, which we call our citizen advisory work group. It's made up of uh, residents from impacted communities. Um, and, and so we've got right now about 89 impacted communities around the state. And, and any time that we're in those communities, we you know, essentially let you know that if you're interested in participating on this Citizens Advisory Work Group, we'd love to have you. And it's a very simple process. Go online and register. And that information gets to me. We typically appoint 
up to two people per community as the official members, but anybody who's interested, you know, we will keep in the loop. And we're looking for two things from the Citizens Advisory Work Group. Um, basically, first is to uh, help us understand how best to engage and empower you. Um, you're the ones that are impacted by this contamination. and We've got protocols for town halls and keeping you informed, but where we can do better and differently that helps address your needs, we'd like to know. And we also have a responsibility to educate the general public on PFAS and the work of MPAR. And so the Citizens Advisory Work Group gets together the second Tuesday of every month in a format very similar to this. That's how they started doing it um, back in December because Citizens Advisory Work Group members are all from all around the state. And so we don't bring everybody into one room. We basically have a format like this, which enables all of them to participate. So again, um, you'll see the URL for the link to the MPART webpage at the end of uh, the presentations here today. Go on there and click on MPART and Citizens Advisory Work Group if you're interested, and we'd love to have your participation. So with that, if we can move on to the next part of the agenda here and i'd like to introduce christian bond he's uh, one of our geologists in the department of environment great lakes and energy you all know him he's going to brief you on where we are with the investigation so christian go ahead yeah thanks steve um make sure i'm unmuted um so what i want to do is just tell the story of you know how we got here um what data we have so far and then what are the next steps um, so I'm gonna uh, take my camera away here so the screen is uh, full size and you can see my maps a little better. Jim, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, what data did we have initially? So uh, from the 2018 to 2019 statewide sampling, um, we had four data points in Pelston, uh, one at the middle school and high school, uh, one at the elementary school, and then two other businesses, one on US 31 and another one on Robinson Road west of the West Branch of the Maple River. Um, those were all non-detect for PFAS. Um, so then in uh, January this year, on January 30th, we received um, a freshwater future result from a, a resident in Pelston. Um, those samples were taken uh, by the high school students in Pelston, um, and that brought to our attention, you know, we might have uh, a PFAS contamination issue here in Pelston. Um, so by February 3rd, we were out there resampling the well, uh, and we received results on February 6th, uh, and they did confirm that um, there were PFOA plus PFOS results over the 70 part per trillion um, drinking water cleanup criteria. Um, that's the criteria that EGLE can enforce. Again, that's uh, 70 parts per trillion PFOA plus PFOS combined. Um, so, you know, we had to put in our sampling areas because our number one priority was to get an idea of, you know, who's affected in Pelston. Um, and then, you know, how can we give them clean drinking water? Um, so we looked at, you know, what's the direction of groundwater flow and what are our possible sources? So um, we had an, an Eagle remediation site, an old gas station on US 31, uh, just east of the Pelson Regional Airport um, that told us, you know, we have some shallow groundwater that's, you know, flowing to the um, south, um, towards the West Branch and Maple River, and then you know, deeper um, groundwater that was going south, southeast um, with the watershed of the Maple River. Um, Pelston Regional Airport is in the you know, higher elevations of Pelston, um, and all of the watershed flows to the south, southeast towards Burt Lake. Um, the West Branch of the Maple River and the East Branch of the Maple River uh, meet at former Lake Kathleen. Um, at the old dam there. Um, so with that data, uh, we were able to, you know, look at, you know, what are possible sources. So one was obviously the Pelson Regional Airport, especially because the confirmed sample was so close to the airport. Um, and then 
you know, we also had a manufacturer and um, where they, you know, also did some plating. Um, we thought that could be a possible source, although that was down gradient or, or downhill from the confirmed sample. So that was likely not contributing to the 70 part per trillion level in um, the uh, one confirmed uh, resample. Um, we also had a closed Pelston dump that was further down gradient or downhill um, uh, that had some old monitoring wells that were sampled by Eagle in the early 2000s to make sure no other contaminants um, such as petroleum compounds or heavy metals um, were affecting uh, drinking water in that area. It was found that you know, no contaminants were affecting drinking water at that time, but we also wanted to resample those wells. So by March 20th, um, our contractor AECOM had sampled 161 wells. Uh, of those, 87 were non-detect for PFAS compounds. Uh, again, we're comparing to the PFOA plus PFOS um, uh, criteria of 70 parts per trillion. Um, there are over 4,000 PFAS compounds. Um, so we're just comparing to the two because that's the only um, regulatory limit that exists at this point for EGLE to enforce. Um, 32, res or 32 of the wells were between zero and 10 parts per trillion, so low level concentrations. Um, 27 uh, wells were between 10 and 70 parts per trillion. Those are your orange dots there. And then 15 were above the 70 part per trillion uh, criteria. Um, all of those 15 were to the south of the Pelson Regional Airport, to the west of US 31, and north of Mill Street. Um, we also saw some concentrations further to the south, um, south in our sampling area, um, in our green sampling area. Um, you can see the triangles on the map. Um, for those of you on the phone, um, they are where um, close to where the west branch of the Maple River crosses US 31. Um, we sampled five wells in that area um, on the Pelston dump. Those are pre-existing wells. Um, two of those had uh, low level PFAS con concentrations um, and, and three were non-detect. The two that did have detections were in line with what we were finding um, up gradient or uphill um, and similar compounds were being found in those wells as um, in the uh, residential wells up gradient, um, telling us you know, that's not a likely source. Um, it also looked like you know, there's one plume uh, coming from the uh, Pelston Regional Airport at this point. We also looked at well depths. Um, we had some questions asked about that, and, and it is interesting data to look at, although um, monitoring wells are going to be better to look at, you know, where are the contaminants um, in the subsurface. Um, but we had 57 um, well logs of the 161 wells that were sampled. Many of the wells uh, don't have logs associated with them because they're older wells um, before um, well logs were, you know, either created or kept on record. Um, no, of the eight wells that were over criteria with a well depth, all eight were less than 100 feet in depth. Um, we also see wells that are close to each other um, with similar depths that have very different concentrations of PFAS. Um, this tells us that there are preferential pathways or small conduits in the ground where you know, PFAS can travel a little bit easier and uh, you'll see higher concentrations in certain um, lenses of sediment in the, in the subsurface. Um, so almost acting like you know, pipes uh, or you know, underground um, rivers where you know, PFAS can travel much more easily and we see some of these higher concentrations. Some of these wells um, are screened um, in, in these uh, conduits because um, they produce water really well uh, also. So um, when a well driller is drilling those wells, they're trying to hit certain lenses, gravelly um, kind of sediment that, that produce lots of water 
um, but they also transport contaminants uh, really easily. Um, so there, we do need to know more about the subsurface. Um, you know, the best way to do that is going to be with you know putting in a, a network of monitoring wells, uh, as Eagle's done in uh, or the liable parties have done at many of the uh, sites in the state. Um, we also see, you know, one dot to the south. Um, at the southern edge of our sampling area, um, that is, you know, between 10 and 70 parts per trillion. So we don't have the leading edge of the plume or the the down gradient edge. So um, what we're going to do is uh, extend our sampling area to encompass Lake Kathleen, um, the US 31 corridor. Um, we're going to look south and west of the, the Maple River, um, immediately along the Maple River to make sure none of the contaminants are jumping to the other side of the river. Uh, most of the times, um, you know, rivers act as a groundwater divide. And um, so we're gonna be looking at um, Ringler Road, uh, Woodland Road, uh, Milton Road, Hartman Road, um, just to expand that sampling area and, and get some additional uh, green dots. Uh, we've also taken off part of our sampling area in the um, northeastern portion of our sampling area. Um, we're doing this because you know, we're not finding any PFAS con concentrations in this area. Um, and we feel safe to say that, um, those, that those areas are not affected and it's really, you know, the areas immediately downgrading of the Pelson Regional Airport and then um, to the south, southeast towards Lake Kathleen um, along the, the west branch of the Maple River um, that are going to be affected. Um, so we've been in communication with uh, Emmett County as well. Um, we've shared data with them and, and um, showed them that uh, the PFAS constituents that we're finding in our results are, you know, indicative of uh, AFFF use, aqueous film forming foam. That's the foam used to put out jet fuel fires um, and that the airport was required to train with. So um, Emmett County has been great to work with. They've, you know, gotten us a work plan. They've responded to our, um, you know, compliance communication and they've told us four areas where they did train with uh, AFFF. They also told us uh, where they stored it. And um, we have some pictures of the types of AFFF that are at the airport. Um, and the airport is uh, scheduled for the statewide AFFF pickup program. So they're going around the state and, and picking up expired AFFF or any excess that, that the airports have that they're not gonna be able to use. Um, so we're going to be working with them. Um, they also uh, are going to be applying for an MDOT grant um, of $250,000 to further assess. Um, that's going to allow them to look at source areas. They're going to be, um, you know, looking at putting in some monitoring wells um, so that we can assess, you know, where is the PFAS in the subsurface? Are there you know, any preferential pathways or conduits in the subsurface? Is it affecting the West Branch of the Maple River? Um, you know, are springs in the West Branch of the Maple River discharging any of this PFAS? Um, we do have some indication that um, there are some uh, you know, low level concentrations of uh, PFO and PFOS in the West Branch of the Maple River. Um, a, a private study did that. Um, so that's something we're going to be looking at doing. And I think our water resources department um, is also going to be, or water resources division within Eagle is also going to be looking at doing some sampling on the West Branch. Um, and with that, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Lisa Fisher with the Department of Health and Human Services. All right. Um, I'm still not saying how to, uh, <laughs> Hey Lisa, this is Jim. Uh, you should be able to click your mouse on, on the slide and it should move forward for you. There you go. All right. 
Uh, thanks, Christian. Um, I, so I'm Lisa Fisher. I'm a toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the health concerns that are associated with PFAS and then go over the results of the residential well sampling and then what public health response actions were taken based on those results. Okay. Jim, it, it like disappeared on me. I can't find the little arrows now. That's no problem. I got gotcha. you. Just go ahead and go. Okay. I'll Thank you. you. <laughs> yep. Um, so I just wanted to briefly go, go over what the role of um, public health is, whether that's the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services um, or the local health department, which is the health department of Northwest Michigan. Um, so our goal is to understand the health concerns that are facing your com community and what are the specific challenges um, that are facing your community that we can help address. Um, so we help to develop a plan to investigate and address these health issues. So EGLE um, leads the site investigation and um, MDHHS and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan lead the public health planning and response actions. Um, so in this case, um, MDHHS, along with uh, Health Department of Northwest Michigan, we evaluated the PFAS results for the drinking water wells, and then we recommended public health actions um, as needed, and then implemented those public health response actions. Uh, next slide. Okay, so if you attended the meeting back in February, you're familiar with this slide. Um, but just to go over it again, these are some of the um, health outcomes that are um, associated with two specific um, PFAS, PFOA and or PFOS. Um, so some of the health effects that are associated with these PFAS include um, lowering a woman's chance of getting pregnant, increasing the chance of high blood pressure in pregnant women, increasing the chance of thyroid disease and PFOA exposure, increasing cholesterol levels, changes to immune response, and an increased chance of some types of cancer, such as kidney and testicular cancers. All right. Um, so I wanted to make clear that um, health problems, if they do occur from PFAS exposure, are not immediate. They're not something that's going to show up, um, you know, a couple weeks or, or years from now. It's something that sometimes takes decades um, before health, health effects occur. Um, but I also want to make clear that if um, health effects do do occur, um, it, it, I'm sorry, um, just because you've been exposed to elevated levels of PFAS for an extended period of time doesn't necessarily mean necessarily mean that you will develop health effects. It just means that you're more likely to than someone who has not had that same exposure. So um, here I've got a table of the comparison values. Um, we also look at um, EGLE's regulatory value of the um, 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS that Christian mentioned earlier. Um, but we also use these comparison values, which are screening levels that are health-based. Um, and when I say health-based, I mean um, that they're designed to protect um, all populations, including sensitive populations, such as fetuses and infants. Um, so these, these um, health-based screening levels consist of both the MDHHS public health drinking water screening levels and the MPART health-based values. So we wanted to use the most conservative of these health-based values when using them to compare your well water results to. Um, so you can see we have um, comparison values for a variety of PFAS. Um, and then if you'll notice, there's um, quite a range in what, what these health-based values are for some of these PFAS. Um, for example, PFNA has a comparison value of six parts per trillion, and PFHXI, PFHXA is at 400,000 parts per trillion. Um, like Christian said, PFAS is a huge family of compounds. There's over 4,000 different PFAS. Um, so not all PFAS have the same chemical structure. And something that accounts for these different screening levels um, is the half-life or how long that these different PFAS stay in the human body. Um, so for example, a, a PFAS with a shorter half-life or a shorter amount of time that it spends in the body 
um, needs to reach a very high level before it causes um, any health effects compared to a PFAS that stays in the body for a longer amount of time and can accumulate more rapidly. So I kind of just wanted to go over why you see um, such a range of values for different PFAS. Um, so here are the results of the, the residential wells. Um, so there were 151 residential wells, wells that were sampled. 86 of them had detections of any PFAS. And of those 86, 41 exceeded one or more of the comparison values that were in that table. And 14 exceeded the part 201 cleanup criteria. Um, I just wanna stress that these are the residential wells only. Um, there were 10 wells that were sampled that were from um, businesses as well, but I wanted to focus on the residential wells um, because that's what we um, base our public health response actions on. Thanks. Um, so how did we determine what public health response actions needed to be taken based on these well water results? So we looked at your individual um, well water result, and then we looked at all the well water results um, collectively. And we also um, took into account information that Eagle had gathered um, from their investigation um, based on where, where potential sources might be, um, the direction of groundwater flow, and um, the, the depths of the wells that we had available, and then what the local geology is. Uh, this area has a, a lot of sand, so that, that was important to know as well. Um, so based on all of these factors and all the information that we had, we decided that um, any residents um, that had any detections of PFAS would be provided a filter that's certified to reduce PFAS. Um, and this was to provide residents with um, protection from PFAS in drinking water until a final solution can be implemented. Um, for homes where there were no detections of PFAS, we decided that no public health actions are necessary at this time. And then if your well was tested, you should have received a letter from us um, saying what your results were and what those results meant and um, included some information about PFAS in drinking water. And I'm going to turn this over to Scott Kinzerski, and he's going to talk about what um, him and his team have done for some of the public health response actions. Hey, thanks, Lisa. Uh, my name is Scott Kinzerski. I'm the Environmental Health Director for the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. And when we first got involved with this site, um, I don't know if you want forward, thank you. Um, you know, we had one result that exceeded the 201 criteria. Uh, which was very concerning to us. And quickly we were involved with uh, not only the community, but the other regulating agencies to really um, determine what the response was going to be. And as Lisa indicated, our public health response strategy really focused around uh, providing interim controls in a way of, of, of um, distributing uh, drinking water, bottled water, so that people had a safe means of drinking water, and then um, looking at providing point of use filters within homes until the environmental investigation was completed and we had some indication of what the long-term solution was gonna look like. So um, when we started looking at, at the area, there was a lot of uncertainty about you know, the scope, the nature, the, you know, the size of the plume, um, you know, how many uh, residences were impacted. So, in the initial days, uh, before we could even get sampling, we were providing water to, to individuals within the community that asked for it. And as samples started to come back, and we had a, a really good uh, three-tiered sampling strategy that Christian spoke of, um, we started to refine that a little bit and <clears throat> really looked at individuals that had any detectable level of PFAS in the water. Um, our, our mission was to provide them with public water or, or bottled water. Um, and we did that through uh, a way of providing water access vouchers. And one of the original logistical um, things we had to deal with was we needed a local source, uh, a distribution center where we could provide water to the public. And so at that point, we reached out to the village and the fire department and secured um, a purveyor of water so we could really move large amounts of water to a central distribution area 
and and work with the village to uh, uh, have employees distribute that water. So we worked with uh, Randy Bricker in the fire department where we have currently pallets of water that we distribute to the to the people that need it. Um, so we engaged our environmental health staff and our community health staff to help assist um, the response. And what they do is when we receive indication that someone has a contaminated well or they are waiting on results, um, we we would go to the community door to door and provide water access vouchers to those individuals so that they had a means to go uh, to the fire department and get safe water. So we obviously established some MOUs with the village and the fire department, and um, you know worked with a, a source of water to make sure that when you know when there's a need in Pelston that we can resupply the fire department. The next step really focused on. Uh, the point of use filters. So bottled water is not a long-term solution. It really was an interim control till we could get filters in homes uh, to provide safe drinking water. And, and the water that we're providing is not for every use. It really is for consumption. So uh, we really were looking at uh, contracting with a local plumber, plumber or plumbing contractor, somewhere that was close that we could be very responsive when we did know of a well that was contaminated and we could get them um, the filter installed in a very quick manner. So we did uh, contract with a, a plumber out of Olanson, which is not far from Pelston, and they immediately deployed two crews, two work crews to the area. And at that time we kind of had a backlog because we we're working through the process of, you know, now I receiving the filters so that we had them to give to the plumber, but also um, working through the bidding process. So they deployed two work crews, and they they worked very rapidly. At, and I, you know, um, within the the community, their vans were were out every day, um, and they quickly deployed uh, um, the water filters to over 63 residences uh, right before COVID, and then things slowed down tremendously. So at this point, we know we have 86 impacted wells. There is a, a backlog of individuals who are waiting to have their, their water tested. And right now, um, due to COVID, the, the contractors for Eagle that conduct the water sampling are not able to do that work. So we did provide them with water vouchers and um, you know we're just waiting those results uh, when they're able to do their work. So we did, you know, as a public health agency, part of our mission is to provide health education. So um, we work closely with HHS. They support the work that we do. Um, I'm not a toxicologist. Lisa Fisher is. You know, this is the relationship that we're in. And you know, when we receive results and, and there are um, uh, measurable amounts of PFAS or PFAS chemicals in in well water, uh, even before we get on site, Lisa is already calling the individual to explain what it means, so they get that very personal. A public health message specific to their sample results and then she lets them know that we'll be stopping by and dropping off a water voucher for them so that they have safe water to drink so that relationship to work works really well um, the other thing is we immediately got a uh, page on our website set up so we have links to the MPART website which is where uh, the community can get the most up-to-date information I know um, it's updated weekly um, or when significant uh, pieces of the investigation are advanced. So that is done. We also assist because we have a public health information line. So we take uh, questions from the community and we try to answer those questions or hook them up with the right people to get their questions answered. But one of the common ones that we receive on that line is, I would like to have my well tested. And rather than send them to Eagle right away, I, we just provide them with the form. Um, that gets faxed or forwarded to Eagle, and then they get on the list to get sampled. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, public health concerns. People that have lived in homes for a number of years are questioning, you know, now that they have a result, what does this mean for my health? And we have those resources to help the community. So, um, overall, I, I think the public health and the environmental response has been very rapid. As Christian noted, at the very, you know, very last days of January, we identified our first um, impacted well, and within days they were out there 
and already had confirmation results and then started this whole um, chain of events that has occurred. Um, and really, like Steve Sliver said at the, at the beginning, this is the result of a group of students working on a project, really looking for the health and safety of their community and discovering a problem that may not have been discovered for a number of years. So um, there are a lot of partners that participate in this. We've, we've attended and, and been a part of town hall meetings. We have uh, weekly or bi-weekly bi -weekly phone calls with either the regulators or um, local officials. Um, Emmett County has been a big player, Pelston, um, the tribe is involved. So it really has been a community driven effort that has got the attention of all the people that can provide the resources to really address this, um, unfortunately, this groundwater contamination issue we have in Pelston. So I think that's it for me. All right, thank you, Scott. Um... Steve, does, do you want to go to questions now, or did you have something else that you wanted to? Yeah, I, I think um, at this point, we could open it up for questions. Okay. I just want to remind everybody that um, for questions during this uh, meeting, if you want to ask a question, you can use the question box you have on your GoToWebinar toolbar. It's a drop down. Just type it in and submit it, and we'll get to it. If you'd like to ask your question verbally, uh, there is a raised hand icon on your toolbar. Just click that and it's going to raise your hand and I'll see it. And then when it's your turn, we'll call on you and unmute your mic so you can ask your question. So hopefully that's easy enough. So I'm going to go to a, got a couple questions that have been written in here. Uh, first question is for the residents that have a filter installed is there a plan to retest to see if the filter has reduced the levels below the maximum amount? Lisa, would you like to take that one? Yeah, um, so currently there's not a plan to uh, resample those wells, but it's something that we'll be talking about and, and thinking about in the future. Okay. Yeah, I'll add to that as well. Um, so in other areas, you know, uh, one or two years later, um, the HHS has resampled wells. They're not sampling um, after the filter. They're sampling, you know, before the filter to see if there's variations of, of PFAS uh, seasonally in those homes or yearly in those homes. Um, so that's been done in Alpena, um, and they're getting ready to do that in, in Grayling as well. Um, but those uh, filters are certified um, by the National Sanitation Foundation to reduce PFAS to safe levels. All right, thanks. We've got a couple people with their hands raised. Uh, first one, uh, Heather Slocum. Uh, Ms. Slocum, I'm going to unmute your microphone, so you should be able to unmute and talk to us. You just have to click the microphone icon and make it green. There okay, you go. I'm unmuted now. Yes. Um, <laughs> as I had mentioned at the town hall meeting, as well as when we had our well tested, we have two wells. One is in our backyard. That is the well that, oh, they're both in the backyard, sorry. Um, but the one I'm talking about um, is the one I use to water my garden. We were unable to have it tested because when they came in uh, February, uh, there was so much snow, they were unable to get back to that well to test it. Uh, when we were at the town hall meeting, my question about um, using this water for our garden came up. If PFAS is ingested through dirt, uh, or consumption, then it would just go, logically make sense that if I use this water on my garden for my vegetables that I eat, it would be, it would get into the food that I'm, I'm trying to be healthy by growing. So I'm wondering if and when I can have someone, and I understand the circumstances right now are not optimal for that, but if and when someone can come out 
to test this well, which is approximately 30 feet, which I believe is about 50 feet uh, more shallow than the one that was tested. So if and when someone could come out and if a filter could be provided for that well. I know that was a long question, I apologize. So I'll start, and um, I appreciate the question. You know, there's a lot that we don't know about what um, your home garden would take up in into the plant and ultimately into the fruit or vegetable um, from different concentrations of PFAS. And that's something that the FDA has been studying um, for how much PFAS is actually in our food supply. And we're working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture as well to try to get a handle on areas that have significant um, application of like biosolids and industrial byproducts with PFAS in them. And we're in the early stages of that. Um, so, I mean, that's a long way of saying we're not so sure what the result would tell you about your, your uh, residential garden. Uh, but I'd also like to open this up to uh, Lisa, Scott, or Christian, if um, you've had similar questions and how we're handling that type of sampling out in the field right now. Yeah, so, you know, as uh, the person that asked the question said, um, it's difficult for us to get out and sample at this point due to COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, MPAR is, you know, working on some guidance for us. Um, so that when, you know, restrictions are eased, we can get back out and uh, be COVID compliant when we do sample. Um, if you can, um, I shared my information, you know, on the slide before. Um, we'll get you a, a well request um, if that hasn't been done already, um, but we'll get you signed up to, uh, to get on the list to get that other well tested. All right. Thank you very much. And just to add to that, um, currently we're providing filters um, for residential homes. So go under the kitchen sink. Um, so I'm not sure how that would uh, work for an irrigation well. Um, typically we, we have not been providing point of use filters um, for irrigation wells, um, just, just so you know. There are special circumstances where we try and find something else. Um, for an irrigation well, I'm, I'm not sure how a point of use um, filter would be uh, practical. And if okay. I can add as well, um, the sampling form is still on the MPAR Pelston website. Um, so with that expanded sampling area, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, if you're in that expanded sampling area or you're in an area that you know has ongoing sampling, um, you know, and you haven't been tested yet, um, fill out that sampling request form uh, and follow the directions on the website there and get that to our, our secretary, Leah McDonald, and she'll process that. Okay, uh, next person with their hand up is uh, James Gillette. Uh, James, you're unmuted now, so if you can unmute yourself, go ahead. Hi, right, thank you very much. Jim Gillette with the Village of Pelston. Uh, three part uh, question, uh, Scott, number one, uh, we are getting low on water at the fire hall. Uh, if you could arrange to have a, another delivery. Uh, the second part is uh, there is a, 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 some speculation and, and rumors around the village that there are sources other than the airport where this uh, contamination may have come from. And uh, I wondered if Christian or Lisa could uh, could address what the odds are that there are other contaminated sites, correction, current uh, sources of contamination other than what took place on the airport. And the third part is for anyone, uh, Steve, Christian, uh, what is our long-term uh, plan here for the village of Pelson? as far as uh, I mean I understand the filters are helping uh, and I appreciate the one that was installed in my house uh, I, I don't look at that as a long-term solution to eradicate this this issue uh, thank you very much for answering 
All right, so Scott had the issue with uh, getting some more water out there, right? Yeah, that's, Jim, that's not a problem. Um, all I need to do is place an order and arrange to to have one of the, um, uh, you know, one of Randy's staff meet meet them, and we will get that done for you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, and then Christian, you want to uh, chime in on us looking for other potential sources in the area? Yeah, so as I mentioned, so the, the other two possible sources besides the regional airport um, are the Pelston uh, dump that's that was closed a long time ago and, and sampled in the early 2000s uh, for other contaminants, um, was shown to not be impacting um, anything down gradient or downhill of that. Um, we sampled that again for PFAS. The indications are that that is not a source of PFAS. Um, we're finding low-level hits in two of those wells, um, and, and the constituents or the types of PFAS we're finding in those wells are the same that we're finding closer to the regional airport. Um, we had our contractor do uh, analysis on uh, a well uh, that's closest to the airport that was over 70 part per trillion uh, criteria. Um, you know, they start looking at the chemistry. And, and everything they saw points to uh, a source um, that's AFFF or, or aqueous film forming foam, uh, more specifically a, a 3M product. Um, we also are looking and have sent compliance communication to uh, an old manufacturer that's uh, closer to, let me see, um, corner of or it's on McRae Avenue um, that was closed a long time ago and it, and it's down gradient of our, a lot of our um, uh, hits that are over 70 parts per trillion um, since that was a plater and and um, or they had possible plating activities um, they may have used um, some mist suppressants those contain PFAS um, but those PFAS compounds are different than the ones that you find in uh, aqueous film forming foam. Uh, so it looks like that is also not the uh, main source of PFAS that's affecting all the residents here. Um, but we are looking further into that manufacturer as well. Yeah, and I would just say that, uh, you know, this is something Christian has said and, and other representatives of Eagle, and I don't wanna, you know, speak for them, but, you know, the way this, is rolling out there's there's two pieces to it one is uh the sampling that's occurring now which is really for public health purposes it does you know give eagle information on on you know how to move forward um in the context of the environmental investigation but but those would be not using the residential wells those would be using monitoring wells and they would be uh, designed and developed to give Eagle much more information than we're getting out of the uh, other residential wells. Yeah, so I'll address the third part of that question as well. Um, so the next steps in this process would be to get a network of monitoring wells in place um, down gradient of the airfield and on the air, airfield itself. Um, that way, if any remediation is done, we can track that. We can also track uh, fluctuations of PFAS over time. Um, and we can look at the subsurface more closely. These are geologists that's, that are going to be logging these, these wells that are installed. So they bring up the soil types uh, and they get very exact information on grain sizes and things like that. Um, that, you know, well drillers don't, they don't take that information uh, when they uh, produce a well log for a residential well. Um, once that's done and once we have our hands around, you know, what's the extent of the plume and, and what's, what are the concentrations at the source? Um, is it a newer source? Is it an older source? Um, then we'll know, you know, what are the right steps towards remediation? Um, are we going to need to do a source removal? Um, is the best course of action to do, you know, a uh, an injection of carbon um, so that you can trap PFAS before it affects residential wells uh, down gradient? Um, so those are things we're going to be looking at. Um, in other areas, uh, like in Grayling, um, the military's, you know, addressed those homes that are over 70 parts per trillion by 
um, installing whole house filters or extending a city supply of water to them. I know that doesn't exist in, in Pelston, but that's also something that could be looked at as a small municipal supply. So there are other options and, and that's gonna be, have to be looked at over time, but you need data to make the, the right decisions. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Um, if it's a given, and I and I am assuming it pretty much is, that the source of our greatest problem here uh, in the plume is the airport itself. Uh, and given that uh, because of that, AFFF has not been used there for some years now. They stopped using it a few years ago. Does this this compound, this chemical, eventually dilute itself to the point where it is no longer a health threat in any way? Yeah, from what I've seen, that, that's unlikely to occur in our lifetime. Um, this is a source that's going to continue to contribute. Um, as you know, rainfall percolates through that sand and through that source material, it'll continue to um, you know, contribute to a, a, a down gradient plume. Um, so that's something uh, you know that has to be addressed. The source has to be addressed, and the plume itself have to be addressed. Or you put in a remedy um, so that people have you know clean water, regardless of what's happening in the subsurface. Thank you. And, and just as a final uh, comment uh, uh, to all of you, uh, as a village official, uh, I so much appreciate the fast action that was taken uh, as soon as this was discovered by the students at the school. Uh, everybody was on board and, 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 and in tune with everything right off the bat. And we, we are very grateful for that and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, we got a couple uh, questions here on the board that I'm gonna read off. Uh, are filters the long-term solution for severely contaminated wells, or is there a further step that will be completed? Well, I think, um, you know, Christian kind of hit on that already, is that, you know, at least the point-of-use filters are not a long-term solution at all. Um, those are temporary um, public health measures, protective measures, while we continue to do the investigation and determine what the best option will be for the long-term solution, whether it's a deeper well, a whole house filter, or a connection to some sort of other supply. And I would add too that, um, you know, we don't know uh, once the environmental investigation starts how long this is going to take to really determine, you know, what uh, removal or remedial actions Eagle can take or will take. Um, depending on what they find. So, um, you know, when we provided the uh, point of use filters, we provided also a replacement cartridge and we know the, the lifespan of those. Um, and we are prepared to provide additional cartridges if, if you know, the investigation goes beyond uh, a year is what, what we have right now. So, um, you know, we are going to move forward in, in, at the same pace as the environmental investigation with the interim controls that the health department can provide. Okay, uh, next question. Does PFAS residue remain on dishes after washing when allowed to air dry? Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, yep. <laughs> So uh, the amount of PFAS that would be found on a, a dish after being washed is, is very, very, very small. Um, really the route of exposure that we're concerned with um, would be through drinking water. Um, that, that's gonna be your main route of exposure. So things like um, bathing or um, you know, brushing your teeth, um, washing your dishes, washing your laundry, um, those aren't going to be your main routes of exposure to PFAS. So, um, no, we would not be concerned about residual PFAS on dishes. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Next question that came in was, should we be getting a blood test to see if we have PFAS? And if so, where do you get tested? Lisa. Uh, that's a great question. Um, 
So there are some limitations with getting a blood test, um, and, and that is, um, first of all, a lot of physicians aren't familiar with uh, blood testing for PFAS, um, so that's something that they have to be familiar with. Um, the other thing is that it, it doesn't really tell you a, a whole lot. Um, there's definitely limitations on, on what, what that can tell you. So it can basically tell you how much, is in, how much PFAS is in your blood um, right now, but it can't tell you how long it's been there or how you were exposed or if you, any health problems that you're experiencing are because of that PFAS or if you're, gonna, if you're likely to develop health effects in the future. Um, so there are limitations to getting your blood tested. Um, so just, just to make you aware of those limitations. Okay, thanks. Got a couple more hands up. Uh, Gregory Cole, Mr. Cole, if you want to, you're unmuted now, so you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, can you, you know? hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm from uh, Oscoda, Michigan. Uh, we also have the PFAS contamination here. And to throw into the conversation of sources, uh, one thing that happened here, or a couple things, there were house fires that were put off, put out with the AFFF foam. And also we had a forest fire that uh, AFFF foam was uh, found to be used. So just wanted to throw that in, if anybody could comment to that. Yeah, I can comment on that. Um, you know, we did talk to the fire chief in the area and um, he talked about, you know, some foams being used on house fires, but not a triple F foam. They were protein based foams. Um, those do not contain PFAS. Um, we're going to continue talking to Emma County and, you know, see if there's any other fires that occurred where they may have used a triple F. Um, but right now it just looks like they trained with it on the airfield. Um, the data suggests the same. Um, we're not seeing any hot spots, you know, in other areas um, outside of that main plume, um, you know, up between the West Branch of the Maple River and US 31. So, but, you know, we are keeping that in mind. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, question on the board here, are there any future thoughts or plans to create a municipal water system in the future to replace the contaminated wells? Christian or Scott? Yeah, so I can't comment on that. You know, Eagle, you know, doesn't have the funding. We do not put in uh, municipal supplies of water. Um, so that's not something we're looking at doing. Um, maybe in the future there could be possible funding sources, grants, things like that, um, and those should definitely be looked into. Um, but Eagle does not fund uh, putting in municipal supplies. And I would add through our, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> through our permitting program, um, we work in conjunction with with Eagle uh, in their Type One program, which would be you know large community supplies, and. We have not received any applications at this time uh, to move forward with even looking at test wells for a municipal water system. Um, there are a number of non-community water systems in Pelston. Um, the school is one of them. Uh, there's a couple others uh, that could potentially give us information about a future uh, uh, municipal water system, you know, because they're deeper wells. Um, they're developed and used at a different rate than a residential well would be. But this time we we just don't have anything um, that's uh, hit our desk or has been applied for. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christian, this is, relates back to your maps that you showed earlier. Uh, are We are the only green dot with several around us that are red and orange. Will we still be able to be retested since some wells are the same depth? Some are deeper and some are shallower. Yeah, so I can speak to that a little bit. So um, what we've seen at other sites is we are not seeing large fluctuations um, in uh, PFAS concentrations um, when we've sampled multiple times. Um, that includes monitoring wells, that includes the, the retesting that was just done in, in uh, Alpena. Um, 
we had no new exceedances of, of you know 70 part per trillion criteria um, so it's likely that if you tested non-detect you're likely to stay non-detect or have very low concentrations of PFAS so um, I do know that at these uh, PFAS sites um, you know DHHS has sample resampled in the past and um, they're going to be analyzing that data to see you know should we do this at every site um, or is the data conclusive and saying you know there's no large variations um, in the the PFAS data um, so you know that is something we're keeping in mind but um, yeah it's it could be your wells at a different depth or it could just be in a little bit different sediment type where um, the hydrology in the subsurface is just a little different and you're getting your, your water from a little bit different direction than someone else. Okay, thanks, Christian. Will, will those of us with filters already installed be provided with more filters when needed? If so, how will we get them? And if not, why? Scott? Yeah, we're we're tracking those. Um, I, I'm assuming this person was uh, provided with a filter and they signed an acknowledgement form. So yeah, we're going to track those and as we are going to provide additional cartridges, replacement cartridges for those filters. So, um, you know, and if you have a concern, you can always reach out to the health department and we can talk about your particular circumstances, but we're still pretty, pretty young in this uh, response. Um, so I don't anticipate you'll need anything for quite some time, but um, yeah, we, as I said earlier, we're just going to move at the pace of the environmental investigation. And, you know, if, if we're a year down the line, we're going to be, you know, resupplying everyone with a, a new cartridge. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Uh, next question. Will the state or Michigan DNR be doing any analysis of fish in the Maple River or deer for PFAS concentrations? So I can speak to that a little bit. Um, the uh, uh, Water Resources Division um, did put uh, the Maple River on their uh, sampling for this year. So they're going to be doing some surface water sampling on the Maple River. Um, that will give them an indication based off of those results whether or not um, you know, those fish need to be tested. If those fish are in low level concentrations that don't cause a buildup in, in fish tissue, um, they won't be sampling those. Um, but you know, if there is any indication, that would be the next step. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of, you know, resident brook trout, but, you know, most of the larger fish coming out of uh, Burt Lake, you know, aren't in that river all year round. So um, they're not as exposed as those uh, resident fish if there are um, those PFAS concentrations in the river. All right. Uh, are the agencies represented here working with local organizations such as Freshwater Futures and other ones? So, Christian, you want to start on that? Yeah, so I can I can start on that. So, um, the Freshwater uh, Future data that was collected by the students, um, that's not public information that can't be shared with us. We can't work directly with a, a private organization like that. Um, they must be shared uh, by a homeowner um, before we can take action and, and resample. We would need to resample uh, freshwater uh, futures results. Um, we do, you know, we are in communication with, you know, some of those organizations. Um, we read their reports. Um, so, you know, there is communication there when when it needs to be there, and I'm always you know open to communication with any group. So if they want to reach out to me, um, they can certainly do so. And I just add that I think provide a local um, avenue for people that may not meet the criteria for testing by Eagle. Um, it, it's a relatively low cost test uh, compared to some of the other labs in the state. So I I do know that there are some uh, individuals and, and residences that have 
had their wells tested by freshwater futures um, because they were unable to through through Eagle because they were outside of their priority um, zones. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, next person who's got their hand up is uh, Lisa Fott. Lisa, I just unmuted you, so you can go ahead and um, ask your question. Hi, uh, this is Lisa Fote with the Village of Pelston, and I was wanting to go back to the question about the possibility of a municipal supply. And the village did actually investigate the possibility of a municipal supply probably about 15 years ago and didn't have the public support. And it's not necessarily something the village is against doing if it comes to that for long range planning, but for everybody to understand the type of investment that that would require to service the, the village alone would probably be off the top of my head, roughly $4 million to install a water system. So we would be willing to investigate it, but obviously the public needs to understand what that investment would be um, on the public behalf as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, what time frame are you talking to be able to get a solid answer on the geology and recommendation of a permanent solution? Christian, you want to uh, touch on that in the pace of the investigation? Yeah, that, it depends on a lot of factors. So right now there's a big slowdown in, in any work that's you know, able to be done due to COVID-19. So um, that's the first hurdle. Um, Second hurdle, you know, is um, getting this uh, MDOT grant money. So that'll be the next step. Um, you know, getting more monitoring wells in place, um, and then you know, doing a remedial investigation um, to see, you know, what is a feasible solution uh, for a remediation option. So um, we're talking on the order of, you know, years. Yeah, okay. Uh, what is the minimum time frame you would feel comfortable predicting a final solution is determined? I guess that's similar to what you just said. <laughs> um, and uh, another one here, what is leaching rate? I was muted. Um, so, you know, the leaching rate, you know, I'm, I'm guessing they mean how much PFAS is leaching into the, the groundwater table. Um, we don't have data on that yet. That's gonna be uh, looked at when they uh, look at the source areas. Uh, once you know the concentrations in the source areas, then you can make some inferences and, and uh, deduce that information. All right. Um, will every property owner be informed of the issues require, um, requiring their property? I'm just reading it as it came in, sorry. Uh, it, will every property owner be informed of the issues? I think it's regarding their property. Yeah, regarding their property. This um, is someone that was, this is someone, that, I, the question before is, is I'm a resident property owner and have been informed of the situation. So they have been informed of the situation. They want to know, um, will every property owner be informed of the issues regarding their property? Yeah, so um, everyone that had their well sampled by Eagle um, got a call from me to go over um, what their results were um, and answer any questions that they had. And then um, they should have received a letter in the mail from us um, explaining what, what their results were um, and some more information about PFAS and drinking water. So we have been reaching out to um, those homeowners in multiple ways to make sure they know what's going on. Okay. Uh, if new residential wells are determined to be a fix, will the homeowners be responsible for the expense of those? Could you repeat that one more time, Jim? Yeah. Uh, if, if new residential wells are determined to be a fix, Will the homeowners be responsible for the expense of those? So we tell people they should yeah. have so their likely well. Likely not. So the the liable party is going to be responsible for you know any fixes 
um, in this area. Okay. All right, uh, going back to the hands raised, looks like we have a few, couple other people. Um, I know uh, Heather Slocum, you had your hand raised a second ago. I don't, you just put it down again, I think. Uh, did you still have a question or not? No, actually that was just answered on that, uh, that last one regarding the liable party okay. uh, being responsible for putting in deeper wealth if that is determined to be the long-term solution. So thank you for the person that asked that. Okay, good. Uh, also on the board here, looks like we got uh, John and Marshall West. I just unmuted your mic so you can ask your question. Yeah, just a quick uh, question about the schools. I know they're in the zone that has tested negative, but since we have so many young children there uh, drinking the water daily, how often will they be retested to make sure that nothing has mitigated over there? Yeah, again, um, there's no plans for you know retesting uh, those wells. Um, ideally, we get those monitoring wells in place, and that can give us an early indication whether or not contaminants are flowing in a certain direction towards any wells. Um, there are also that well happens to be both those wells happen to be you know one on the uh, eastern boundary of our sampling area, um, which doesn't have many detections, and um, two, um, they are deeper wells. So um, you know, we're seeing this impact in, in wells 100 feet uh, or less in depth. Um, we're not seeing these impacts um, in wells 100 feet or greater. And again, we don't have the data to know exactly what's down there, and that's what those monitoring wells will show us as well, or boring, soil borings. Um, they'll tell us, you know, is there some kind of clay layer that keeps contaminants from, from going down that deep, or or is it just um, the plume itself that's you know staying at a certain depth in the subsurface? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just want uh, to add one, one thing to one. that. Um, those are considered uh, type two or non-community water supply wells. At this time, um, you know the state does not have any additional requirements once the schools have tested non-detect. Um, they also um, sampled all non-transient facilities, which are larger non-community water supplies, as well as daycares. Um, th there is a testing regimen if you detect any PFAS chemicals, but because they detected non-detect or they uh, were tested non-detect, uh, there are plans from the non-community program. All right, thanks. Uh, we did have somebody here type in a question about will everyone watching receive minutes of the meeting? And I can answer that one. Uh, yes, we are recording the meeting and we all share it with the team here to share with uh, attendees from this meeting and we'll post online if that's appropriate. Uh, I do see, uh, we don't have any more questions on the board. Looks like we answered all of them. Uh, one more hand up. Uh, Jim Gillette, your hand is up again. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> that $4 million that Lisa Folt referred to uh, uh, is about 12 years of general operating money for the village of Pelston. So obviously, we cannot undertake a, uh, a uh, central water system for the village of Pelston without a great deal of help from other agencies. Uh, Christian, uh, given the highest number that you have found in any well in your Pelston testing, would you give us a comparison of the highest numbers you're found in uh, Skoda, Alpina, or Grayling, just so that we can get a grasp on where we are in this contamination? Yeah, sure thing. So um, I'd have to pull my data up here. Um, that might take a second, but um, I don't have any knowledge of uh, Escoda. Um, I'm not the project manager for that site, um, but I do know um, that the plumes coming, especially one plume coming off the Grayling Army Airfield, um, is you know much higher than um, what we're seeing in Pelston. Um, you know we're seeing levels here. I want to say you know uh, 
just under 200 parts per trillion PFO, PFOS was the highest level we saw uh, in Pelston. Um, we're seeing, you know, uh, two or three times that in the grayling area. Um, but I don't have the data in front of me, so I don't know the exact numbers, but, you know, um, it is, you know, two or three times higher in the, in the grayling area. All right. Thanks. 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 Uh, a couple more people's questions here that are uh, asked to be called upon. Uh, Michael Reeves. Michael, I'm here, Mike. Thank you. I'm the Emmett County Administrator, and I want to thank uh, Eagle and the Health Department for uh, participating in this event for Emmett County residents and others so they can learn more about this. Uh, first of all, Emmett County would be disappointed if we didn't, you didn't continue your investigative work and make sure of uh, any and all sources of this uh, uh, contaminant are located. Uh, second, you didn't comment on any of the tests that were done at the airport that uh, showed no contaminants. Um, is that something that you released to the, uh, the public? You're talking about the two um, wells that are used by the air, airport? Correct. Yeah, so those are on the east side of the airfield, you know, kind of side gradient to uh, the training areas. Um, and those wells are greater than 100 feet in depth. Um, they were both non-detect. Um, so it's likely that, you know, those training areas um, are above those wells. And as that plume moves, you know, down gradient, um, it can't get down that deep to those wells so close to the source area. Thank you. The second question I'd like to ask is, uh, you didn't speak of the requirement for Public Act 139 airports, and similar to Grayling and other locations in the state of Michigan, were mandated by the FAA to uh, utilize this AFFF foam. Can you speak to anything in regards to the federal government being ultimately responsible for this mandating? Well, I, I can uh, chime in on that and um, can't really speak to the ultimate liability but I, I think the uh, you're right airports across the state um, and across the country have been mandated to have that military specification a triple F and you know that's one of the reasons I think we've got kind of a multi-pronged approach number one collecting it from those that don't need as least as much in their inventory and then uh, you know M part and our federal partners are working on alternatives to get that out of the stockpile. If we can find something uh, that is equally effective, in fact, that's uh, a requirement under the National Defense Authorization Act. But as as you can imagine, I don't think um, there's any of the manufacturers out there who have accepted responsibility for for um, this across the country. And um, you know, I, I think that's something that's yet to be determined. Okay, thank you again for uh, your assistance in putting this on. I think it's uh, very helpful for the residents. It's good to know, glad to do it. All right, thank you. Uh, one another person with their hand up, uh, Richard Carlson. Richard, go ahead. Yeah, am I on now? Yes. Yeah, yeah I am a property owner in Telston. And uh, but I'm not there. I lease there, rent that property. I did not know about this problem until uh, the PFAS until I got back a week ago, and I see it on the uh, local news. That's why I'm attending this evening. I'm just wondering if the property owner should not have received information regarding this situation because I was told in the dark and I felt a liability to my renters. Yeah, so um, usually when we have information that uh, a residence is going to be sampled and that it's a, a rental property, um, we try and get the information of the um, tenant, tenant and whoever owns the property. And we send the results letters to, to both of those parties. Um, so if, if you haven't received a letter, um, feel free to reach out to me and we'll make sure that you get that. If you have any questions, just, just contact me. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Okay, uh, Heather Slocum, got your hand up, go ahead. 
Yes, this is in regards to the village water system that was uh, talked about previously. I understand that it was proposed, uh, I believe someone said a few years ago, and the residents voted against it and that it would cost, I believe she said, approximately $4 million to have one put in. Um, I also, when we were talking about having a deeper well put in at whose expense, uh, I was uh, told the liable party would be responsible for that. How does the liable party uh, fit in with the village water system and the cost of that, uh, would it all fall on the village tax payers or would some or all of that um, fall on the liable part? Well, Christiane, do you wanna uh, tackle that a little bit from the part 201 perspective? Um, and you've already given examples of where uh, Department of Defense being responsible in grailing has extended or paying to extend a, a water system there. Yeah, so I can you know talk about that a little bit. So um, you know it's it's most likely going to be you know a combination of you know trying to get money from you know every source that we can. I know um, you know Eagle's in the process of of uh, litigation um, with you know, manufacturers and, uh, you know, uh, distributors of, of AFFF and other PFAS. Um, so that's something, you know, a possible future source of, of, of funds for something like this. Um, you know, there are sometimes federal grants um, that make it easier for a community to put in a municipal system. Um, those come and go as, um, as the economy does well and, and, and does poorly. So, um, but you know, for any other 201 site, um, if a, a party caused contamination, um, they are responsible for one, um, looking at, you know, where is it going? Uh, is it affecting anyone? Um, and that's something Eagle is already doing at this point. So that's you know something something we're already doing that we normally wouldn't for for other uh, contaminants. Um, and and then. The liable party is also responsible for, you know, mitigating any um, one health health effects to people. So, you know, making sure it doesn't affect drinking water wells, and they're also responsible for making sure it doesn't affect any bodies of water nearby. So, um, under Part 201, um, the liable party is responsible for um, addressing all parts of the contamination that was caused. Okay, so regarding I believe someone on your panel previously said no one has stepped up forward to accept responsibility regarding this. Is that correct? Or are we to figure that the airport would be doing that? I, I don't say completely since they were just using the product that they were told to use. I think I'll jump in here and then Christiane or anyone else. Um, yeah, I think right now it's really too soon to say what these source or sources of the contamination are. And that's the, the longer term investigation that, um, you know, Christiane and, and Scott have talked about. That's going to take some, you know, some time. So I, I think it's, it's kind of hard to point fingers at anybody right now or to, um, you know, come up with, um, you know what we think might happen depending on what the data might say i think there's a danger to that i think what's right now is really most important is that you know we have these public health uh, protective measures you know being instituted while we're finding the contamination and then devote uh, resources to trying to figure out where it's coming from and how bad it is so that then we can determine whether or not it's going to be a deeper well for some people or whole house filters or a municipal system Thank you. Okay, and uh, going back to uh, Jim G Jim Gillette. Jim, you're unmuted.
Uh, Mr. Glutt? There we are. Okay. I, I, I forgot to press on my microphone. Uh, mm -hmm. I can address uh, a part of uh, Ms. Slocum's uh, uh, question with regard to a municipal water system in Felston. Uh, this was not a, uh, a, a voter-based uh, decision. Uh, this was a grant that was given to the village of Felston uh, a number of years ago, probably 12 or 14 years ago, uh, for a feasibility study through the University of Michigan, uh, which distributed questionnaires throughout the village on uh, people's feelings about a municipal water system. And secondly, whether or not uh, cost-wise it was feasible. And it was determined through that study that most people in the village of Pelson did not favor a municipal water system. They liked the water they have. Uh, and secondly, the, uh, the it was not going to be cost effective because uh, of the low number of uh, residences within the village that would sign up for uh, a municipal water system. So that's what happened there and, and, and it just didn't happen. All right, thank you. I think this is our last question, um, according to what I see here. Uh, why weren't every property owner in Pelston notified? I have a seasonal property in town and wasn't made aware of this issue except from, from a friend. There must have been a better method than going door to door. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. We didn't go just go door to door. We also talked to the village of Pelston, Emmett County. We talked to multiple uh, media sources in the area. Um, so we tried what we could to get the word out. Uh, we can only pull so much private information, um, you know, when we go out to sample. So, um, you know, we did what we could and, you know, um, we hope that people talk and that, you know, people get the news and that people um, get these multiple avenues that, that we're putting this information out on. Okay, uh, Steve, it looks like I think we got everybody covered here. So um, yeah, I think you're ready to take us out if, if you want. All right, well, I do once, once again want to thank uh, all the panelists here tonight for the presentation, sharing the information and being as transparent as we can throughout this process on, on what we know and don't know as we try to address the contamination and making sure that we're protecting public health along the way. And I really appreciate all of the participants, the attendees, the good questions you had tonight. And, uh, you know, we'll do everything we can to keep everybody informed along the way. And I'm assuming we'll probably be scheduling, a, you know, another one of these virtual possibly uh, town hall meetings uh, in a couple of months once we've got some more data and, and have something to share with you. So. Jim, thanks a lot for running us tonight. You did a great job. Uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.